sí, es muy largo y tendido. Si os ha gustado la charla de Omar, que sepáis que... If you liked Omar's talk, remember Kudeski's people are hiring, so we'll soon have job offers on the rooted, rooted list. Please sign up if you're not there. And next, we have Juan Antonio with us. Juan Francisco, sorry. I'm going to tell you about what we're doing at BVA. We think that this is a paradigm change regarding how we are historically focusing large companies, technology, and security. And this is quite exciting. So it would be great to share with everyone. Well, BVA is a pioneer in technology and aesthetic changes regarding technology. They're the first people who outsourced email. Yes, we're in Google with our email. We've been there for five years in a very secure way so far. A big round of applause for him, please. My name is Juan Fran Losa. I lead the whole part of security architecture globally in the BVA group. And my aim today is to share with one, with everyone this mess we're in. The most passionate and exciting mess of everything that I've done in my professional career. If someone told me about this two years ago, I wouldn't have believed it. I wouldn't have believed the things that we are really doing. Throughout the presentation, I'm going to tell you first about the context so that you may understand why we are working on this. It's not just about getting a group of freaks together who feel like changing the technology of a bank such as BBVA. But I, I'd like you to start thinking and then we'll talk about it at the end of the presentation. And in your opinion, what's the most important thing for all of this that I'm going to tell you about today to really happen? After thinking about it a lot, we reached some conclusions regarding the most important bits, but I'd like you to reflect on that throughout this speech. So I'm going to give you a bit of a context first. I'm going to try to do it as quickly as possible, but I think it's necessary to understand what we're doing. And then we're going to go more in depth into all these technological changes, not just technological, but also philosophy and DevOps, as Omar was saying, that we're implementing the group globally. Mm -hmm. And first of all, we have to look at the bank, what's BBVA? Uh, you may imagine that we're going to tell you how many countries we are, how many customers do we have. And I will tell you that, but the first point is this one. BBVA right now is software. And the first time we did this analysis, I was quite impressed. We have 400 million of lines of code. And right now, in the group worldwide, there are over 11,000 developers working. So this is just for you to think of the scale we're talking about and the scale at which we're planning to do everything that I'm going to tell you about. In the technology group in, in BBVA, 
uh, we are 20,000 people. And, and what do those uh, 9,000 extra people other than bothering uh, developers? Uh, but BBVA is not only software. It's always data. It's also data. And this is not the right scale, but we're managing 2.5 uh, petabytes, and our idea is to escalate in the next four years to over 100. And why? Because right now, we are underusing the data of our customers. We are not generating the value from all the information that we have about our customers, and that is one of the strategic goals for the next few years. We want to save everything, store as much information about context, transactions, everything that we have to be able to generate for value for our customers. And of course, BVVA, our customers, Uh, right now, we have 50 million customers worldwide, and with uh, transaction ratios that you can see there, 114 million of uh, monthly access from the mobile phone worldwide. So this is just to give you context about what we are. We're not only employees and, and customers. We're software. We're data. And of course, we are and the uh, technology that affects us. Uh, we are present now in 10 countries worldwide, and we're doing this in 10 countries. And we, there are some 140,000 employees in BBVA worldwide. But beyond this context, we have a lot of challenges. And we are a bank, and everybody is aware of the challenges faced by the financial world. And we can uh, classify those challenges in regulation. And with what's happened in the next few years, this pressure is increasing. And, and that gives us big challenges regarding technology with the considerable an aggressive impact on how we have to report a number of things. And here I wanted to take some time because often in the world of security, we have confused two words um, for a long time, regulatory compliance and security. We have used them as though they meant the same, but they are different words. They mean different things. and. And they do so in, in the languages that I'm familiar with. You can comply with regulation and nevertheless have a lot of security uh, failures or shortcomings. And the other way around, you may have very good security and be unable to convince your regulator that you're, you're, that you're secure. So this is something that we have to keep in mind when, as I tell you about what we're doing. The second challenge is digital clients, whatever that means. They have increased transactionality in, in, immensely. Each time you connect to BBVA, you generate a transaction in the mainframe. Yes, mainframe. Banks still have mainframes, and every transaction in our mainframe costs money. And that's another of the reasons why we want to do what I'm going to tell you about. And the third challenge our new incumbents, Facebook, Amazon, uh, Google, uh, Salesforce, players that are digitally native, which is not our case, and that are beginning to approach part of our business that they didn't used to. Uh, recently, Amazon expressed interest in, in, Bay in, ca in buying Capital One, which is a big bank in the United States who's made quite a lot of progress in the digital sphere. And they're beginning to talk uh, about these technology companies to buy or enter the financial sector. So in the face of this context, there are two things that we have to do, that we have to achieve, and that right now we're not doing. In fact, we're probably doing them quite, quite poorly. One is we have to cut 
whatever it takes, the transaction cost. The backend technologies that we have in banks right now are cannot escalate with the transaction demand that we have right now with these uh, digital customers. And on the other hand, we have to be able to improve radically the time to market to provide to our customers new, with new business uh, functionalities and being able to uh, compete with these new players that can think of an idea and, and implement it in a few weeks. And taking into account that, of course, what's crucial for us is to contribute value for our customers. But of course, we're still talking about a bank, about the financial sector, and of course, security. Security is something that is a, a crucial part, part of the core of the bank technology. And that's one of the things that I'm going to tell you about, how in this whole landscape, how we have to change the classical approach radically, the approach that technology, that security departments in this sector have had. I think this applies to all sectors, but in the financial sector is absolutely crucial. Unless we change our mindset it, it's going to be impossible to compete in the environment that I've just presented to you. So I've given you the context. Let's let's get on with it. Let's tell you about what we're doing. What I'm going to tell you about is not an innovation uh, project that we're doing in an isolated sandbox of the group. What I'm going to tell you about is what we want to do for the for the new execution architecture that we're going to have for the BBA group worldwide. And when we started this journey, which we started a year and a half ago, and I'll give you some more context, we set up an area called architecture. And I'm part of security architecture in that department. And architecture is not what used to be uh, architecture in a company, which was about mm, they wrote a paper and expected for the other people to adhere. But in this case, architecture designs, executes, and operates what it designs. So we are responsible for what we say needs to be done, then we do it, and then we are accountable for production. And it's not just about a paper then. And we started to think about what we should do, and we concluded that we needed a global uh, platform uh, for development and for banking execution with certain features that to us, looking at the context we're in, but also because of uh, who we are. Uh, the first uh, feature was that it needed to be global. We are present, sort of, we are uh, doing commercial banking in 10 countries, United States, Mexico, Chile, Peru, Colombia, Argentina, uh, um, Uruguay, Paraguay, of course, Spain, Venezuela, and Turkey. And it made sense for this to be a global platform. Of course, doing specific things in certain countries where there are certain prod banking products that do not exist elsewhere. But the platform operation and the core technology and the line it had to be global. Another of the requirements was that it should um, use low-cost infrastructure, that is x86, pure x86, x scalable. Uh, leave the mainframe behind uh, once and for all. And of course, our idea is not to switch it off in the next five years. That's not realistic. It's impossible. There are incredible amounts of codes there. And we have to be realistic and prismatic with what we're going to do. But of course, the new platform had to run on low-cost infrastructure and to be scalable. It all should be as automated as possible and absolutely everything software-defined. And that everything includes infrastructure and security. 
So no remedies where somebody operates something uh, without knowing why things are being done. So everything software defined and deployed. Another feature, and this is the one that generated more debate. We wanted it to be based on open source technology. Historically, big companies and banking companies, we've had a huge vendor lock-in that have conditioned the evolution of the, the technological evolution of the, our strategy. The history of banking, the mainframe, came from IBM, but we could give you tons of examples. So we really wanted to be open source. We wanted to be owners of what was being executed. And it's not that the BBVA needs to be the prop, um, open, the owner, but that we could contribute to the open source. Uh, we have um, over 20 day open source technologies right now, and it's one of our strategic um, uh, technologies to keep on making progress on that. The fifth feature is data centric because in history we were not so much uh, data centered by technologies for focusing on on products mainly sort of uh, assets or liabilities products i don't want to go into the financial uh, tech, uh, terminology but there was one uh, there was no information shared between different products but we believe that data has to be at the center of the platform we're developing now and finally, we wanted this model to be a hybrid model. And when we say that, we are talking about private cloud versus uh, public uh, cloud. We want to be able to use the advantages of, uh, of the scaling possibilities of the public uh, clouds. Um, in a natural way and using it as a starting point of what we were doing. That's the beautiful thing. But the, the little problem is that we have to do that while the bank keeps on giving service to our customers. And that's the downside. But for me, it's the most the fascinating part of what we're doing because setting up a platform like the one we, I'm going to tell you about is a technological challenge. It has its, its complexity in terms of technology. But doing it, uh, sort of changing the wheels of the car while you're driving it at 300 kilometers per hour, sort of keeping up with the regulatory pressures and with production that we have to integrate all of this with our legacy systems that we are not going to switch off in the short term. That's what's complex about the challenge we have in our hands. And, and of course, with everything uh, to do with security, everybody is aware that uh, the financial industry is uh, the main target of um, cyber attacks of, of criminals, which often are more organized than ourselves. Uh, so doing all of that in our circumstances is what's really hard. And that's where we begin. I'm going to go into more detail. This is what we're doing. This is not theory. What I'm going to tell you uh, now is going to go into production in June this year for all BBA countries. And with this model, we made a decision, a decision about infrastructure, which is to go to OpenStack uh, for the private uh, cloud um, uh, part and, and to make an alliance with Amazon for the public one. So one of the requirements was we want to divert traffic to public uh, cloud or workload in a transparent way. So the only driver for change between the private and the public clouds are, is cost, the marginal cost of the transaction. So that in terms of infrastructure, of course, to the left-hand side, I am pointing, I'm listing five countries because we're going to have five regions within this whole platform, Spain and Mexico as two critical hubs within 
our environment where we have the greatest uh, share of business. And then we have Turkey, Argentina, and Venezuela that because of regulatory pressures, there are requirements, regulatory pressures, where we cannot take the data outside of the country. Argentina is becoming more flexible recently, and we can take the data outside of the country. And, and taking the data out of the country is not an obsession. It's about replication of data to, to, to ensure um, availability. Uh, Venezuela and Turkey look like they are not going to change in the short term, so we're going to have a dedicated region. But in Argentina, in Argentina things are improving also because of latency issues, etc. That was a decision, uh, a design decision. Beyond this infrastructure layer, we have our architecture uh, layer. Uh, we are setting up a Lambda architecture, but conceptually we're basically going to have there available for all developers that may need it, the maximum possible information and ideally all information that's being, man being used. As I've said earlier on, the sooner we have all the information available to start giving value to our customers, the better. And next to that, rather than on top of that, we have the platform itself, the execution platform, which we want to base in OpenShift with Kubernetes as a manager and with all components located or easy to find. So we're going to have microservices that we will show to the platform developers as APIs, where we will finally, and that was something that we wanted to be able to do, so to reuse code between different countries. Because right now, uh, up to now, each country developed its own code end to end, and there was uh, zero or very little reuse between developers. Of course, there are countries that have specific uh, products, but the microservice of doing a, a bank transfer is very similar. Well, the States is not the best example, but uh, between Spain and, and Mexico, or Peru. So that's our approach, roughly. Something that's also important, and it is important for us from the viewpoint of security, is this is not about some technology people to sit in a room for five hours uh, for 10 weeks and decide that this is what needed to be done. What's important for us is that from minute one, we've been doing this design jointly. And that's one of the key parts of what we're doing. In the architecture area, there are many disciplines, but there are two core disciplines, as we call them, infrastructure, uh, IaaS, uh, platform, pass, uh, da data architecture, and this is the core of the decision making and, um, and our strategy definition. And now we move on to security specifically. This is what we have to do. How are we going to do security? And even though we were on the design area, the first approach, when you are told this is this, to compute in public and in private uh, cloud where the only priority is uh, uh, cost when when it's uh, we're talking about microservices that uh, scale horizontally where you have a docker that um, makes you lose uh, visibility of what's available etc it's not simple but after this first approach that was not quite appealing. I had this second one. And I said, well, after this, I'm going to go with my kids, which at the time were one and two years old, because all of this is happening to me without being able to sleep properly at night with two very young kids. And when 
when we decided that we had to do this, I said I'm going to watch Lion King and, and, and relax. And this was my third approach. This is what it is. It's a fascinating challenge. It's, a, it's fascinating the fact that for the first time in history, security is being really taken into account to participate from the very beginning, from scratch. So we, my third reaction was just, I'm going to go for this. And trying to, to define specifically what we're going to do, we could do it in different ways. We could have used this classic approach. Let's look at the Garner uh, magic quadrants. Let's see who is at the top to the right in every uh, one of the things we have to do. Let's get invited for lunch. Let's buy technology, and that's it. That's great because I have bought the best technology for to do everything, any one of the things I need to do. But this is the second part of that decision. Let's play this game. Let's play Tetrix. Once you've bought each one of the best uh, security pieces, and you have to integrate them all. And that becomes so complex, the classic approach doesn't seem to fit. So we decide to undertake something even more classic, which is rather than going head on, we're going to look at the controls that should take place and let's, with COVID. And I've done a COVID uh, risk analysis. I've certified myself and, and, but this actually wasn't realistic either. So we decided to take a step that was hard, although we had some experience with, with the company I4S, which is a group company, but we decided that it was uh, the only way of doing uh, security in the platform that we're thinking about. And that was about meeting the very principles or adhering to the very principles of the platform. So based on open source technology, we decided to develop our own security products. We probably had no alternative because what we're seeing with the technologies we're discussing, where there are many security products that are not mature to protect what we are doing, but also that we should opt for open source technology and to meet all the, or to have all the features that I've listed to you, I think this is a reasonable conclusion if and only if you have the appropriate support from the top. And as I was saying, we're already doing this. We were doing some of these things, not at the scale we're doing them now, but we did have this company within the group that was doing its own security products and its own security technology. So we use that as a lever. I've given you three examples in the slide, but now we have seven security pro products in parallel, and each one of the products is helping in some parts of the chain, of the value chain. And does that mean that we're going to develop all of the security technology that we need for the platform that I have explained to you? That's definitely not the case. This means that we're going to develop what it makes sense that we can develop and some niche things that can be helpful sort of at a point in time we will have to integrate. Of course, we will have to integrate third-party technology, but only if they meet the requirements uh, that it can be executed on dockers, all of the features that I've been telling you about. Because security is not going to be different from the other colleagues in, in architecture that are developing this platform. Security will be services just like there'll be business services to offer to our developers in the platform. And of course, other things that we will not be able to offer our developers and we will have for um, security, but it will, they will have to have the same APIs.
This is a decision. This decision, the buy or build, mm, I buy or I, or I use Gartner or I do it myself. Well, manufacturing is complex. I'm, I'm being uh, funny about it, but if you buy something to the manufacturer, when something fails, you can always call the 24 by 7 service of the manufacturer, of the vendor, and, and they'll solve your problem. But when you build your own critical parts, you have nobody to turn to when you have a problem at 3 a.m. It's your own team that has to solve that problem. And we are talking about placing these parts in a real banking platform. As I'm, I was saying at the beginning, we're not talking about setting up something in a sandbox. And this is a painful decision because in order to make this decision, you have to change the mindset of everybody, including your own and your team. You have to change plenty of things, recruiting processes, people you have. It's, a, it's really a complex decision. And I show you this picture because because we believe that on top of uh, sort of meeting the platform requirements and the, how it fits with the future, we believe that the uh, security parts can help us, uh, give us a competitive advantage in the market. In history, people in security, we've been like in a cage in the company where nobody talked to us. And more and more what we're seeing in the digital market and in the digital banking is that security is beginning to be a differentiating factor for our customers. I read a survey the other day when it said that 90% of uh, Spanish banking customers would change their bank, would leave their bank if there was an important security breach. We want to be owners of our future, not only for all of these context uh, issues, but because we believe that security is going to be, it's going to make the difference in the short term when it comes to offering value to our customers. Of course, we do not want to reinvent the wheel. We do not want to have our own security protocol. We do not want to do things that do not connect with third party elements because eventually all of these development platform, right now it's going to be used by the VVA uh, developers, but it's been designed with Scratch to be used by third parties who want to use our banking services. So everything has to be standard, the security protocols, authentication protocols. We have no interest in reinventing the wheel. We develop this uh, technology because that um, gives us an edge, but we do not want to invent um, what doesn't need to be invented. And we want our staff to communicate with everything else. And that is that entails a radical change. The classical approach, and, and I'm generalizing, and I'm sure there are companies that, in which it's not uh, the case, taking your black box and put it in, in the middle of your network and starting uh, getting the red alert. This is about something else. As I've, everything is uh, according to the same APIs. Everything is just as a service, things that you can use. Because if I say that is that gives us a competitive edge compared to our, because our customers really value the whole authentication process and authorization, authorization process when it comes to doing uh, transactions sort of remotely. That's something that has a great impact for users. And that's another very important element in our digital world. So to sum up, this entails carrying out a radical change in technologies we use and the mindset security teams have so far. As I was saying, not just for technology, but also for our mindset. We need, most of us need to come back to programming, which is good. Just so that you get an idea 
we have internal hackathons when the architecture manager is programming. It's been hard to get the dust off everything there because I haven't done it for a while, but we're working on it. And of course, we need to be flexible. We need to be updated. All these technology is stuck. Is the technology is stuck that we decided to follow last year, and probably next year we'll have a different stack. A stack with Kubernetes, Nexus, or maybe the following the Kafka that may help us do what we need. This is a vehicle to the information we need. And then the last one is to become the enabler of this technological transformation. Mar was mentioning that earlier. This is not just about having security everywhere, just checking that people are doing things well. This is about security, setting up the infrastructure and the necessary tools for people who really do security so that they can do it. And security isn't just other people who do security. Security is something done by everyone who works in the technology area. We need to change the mindset of the area. Well, I work in security. If I don't admit the risk, if I don't put a stamp on it, I cannot get out. We need to understand that we're all developing and performing a role in the organization. Everyone involved here has security on the table. But to do so, we need to make things easier for our colleagues and our developers. They need to be able to do tests and know how they're doing. They need to be well trained. We need to do quite a few things for that to really happen. And of course, the main one is that we as a security area need to change the mindset that we have historically had. And here's the landscape of everything we're doing. We're doing a few more things, actually, that are not reflected there. But here are a few characteristics and some products that we already have. Is that for the time for questions or including questions? With questions, OK. Then I'll speed up a little bit. Okay, so as I was saying, the aim for this session is to go into the detail of some of the products we're creating. Why are they there and what is inside them? So we brought three examples. One of them is Chimera that will help automating the full continuous integration DevOps circuit we're setting up in the company and how will we carry out security tasks in that circuit with continuous integration. Then we have Armadillo, which is an inverse proxy, exposing authentication protocols externally to be able to interact with consumers. And we've tried to make it as light as possible because this part will receive all the calls of the applications to our platform. And I go back to what I mentioned earlier, if that piece drops, if this doesn't work, we'll have no one to call. We'll need to solve that by ourselves. And this part is very special and it will become critical in the banking implementation platform and development platform we're mentioning. And the third item is looks that allows us to do all the authorization in a dynamic way or however we want to do it in the new model. Regarding the details, I'm going to talk about Chimera, which is multi-cloud, it's open source based, mainly Terraform, Ansible, and it just gives us the infrastructure and it gives us all the security functions we want to provide. And this is the technical architecture of the platform. 
during the coffee break we can deal with this a bit more and in the audience we have the father of the baby who may be able to solve some technical doubt you may have but the most relevant thing here is how to integrate security in the full continuous integration life cycle what has been happening so far is that whenever we get a new project there is a, an area called project security and if you can think of a better name please let us know because we've been trying to change the name for a while but you know that person go to go to the developer and said hey what do you want to do we talk about the new different agile scaling we're doing different parts of a bank and there is a dis- security design done so which control security controls should be in place for this to go into production in a reasonable way the reality is that they tell us about the project we do the document and then we have peace of mind okay this should be coded in res we need to open a firewall rule and we open the firewall in the legacy side but we leave a note with what they should do and then they may or may not do it and that goes into production we do some ethical hacking and we control everything that goes into production in the ethical hacking we detect things maybe not everything we should detect but according to the results it goes into production that's a process we currently have with projects and that happens 1800 times last year 1800 projects at BVA group level that we channel globally with the support of our hands in the countries and in the projects we get some other business as usual projects and these everything but repeatable and there are no security enforcements so where are we aiming to go we think that there are opportunities to keep a full integration life cycle that allows us to have a better time to market for applications and meanwhile we can improve security but what are we doing here well first of all instead of the developer choosing what what have they they want to do with infrastructures and so they're going to have a platform they're going to have a new project on the platform with different flavors such as architecture the developer will not decide on the architecture of the application we want the architect the developer to focus on the business needs that give value to the customer so this is what we call the healthy buffet the developer will be able to cho- to choose on the type of projects that they want to accomplish that may be approved and designed by security so that whenever a project is decided the infrastructure associated is generated such as open stack necessary for that project to be implemented so historically you need to talk to the database guy to get a database you need to talk to the infrastructure guy to get a space on the file system so the developer was not developing he was just trying to get infrastructure for the project and we want to make this automatic so that the magic happens automatically we follow the deployed infrastructure whenever they decide which type of project they want to carry out and for my project security people the time we work on this will be reduced by deciding on certain topics but that's not everything certain security items such as coding or encrypting certain things that are not part of this healthy buffet that I was mentioning so we want our security positions to be in a place where they can be checked programmatically instead of a paper and I think there may be all the colleagues around here but we'll probably keep the paper just in case there's some break to requirement to keep the official document of our positioning but our aim is that our positions in each project are checkable so that whenever the developer does a unit test and then decides to go into a continuous integration circuit for the integration we can control the project security so that we can say well what do we say about this project in the continuous integration 
pipeline well we need to encrypt this for res are we doing the code are we doing the coded API or API name might not be complying with our positioning okay we go back if needed in this full integration cycle we're adding more things such as static code and dynamic code analysis we look at the full infrastructure deployment and whether it's well finished but ideally we do enforcement of our positioning while we upload the things in this cycle and this will change the rules of the games and may be painful for developers because they're not used to this on the one hand we'll give these better time to market and on the other hand they'll be quick if they play fair with the security rules of the game and we may be thinking okay whoever does it better deserves better credit so that our security analysis is lighter just having some sort of security credit for developers so that depending on their past behavior we become more or less enforcers okay that's just an idea that is not even implemented the next part is armadillo this is a part that we created at the time for the digital banking that has evolved quite a bit through time but XACML is in force here it receives all the microservices requests for the platform it orchestrates all the calls for authenticating the consumption of that service and as you may see here this is open source base it's got hot protection we activate it and it does enforcement on the go and there are quite a few functionalities shown there it is based on the Apache proxy and there are a few more things such as LK for log stacks and a few more things I will not give you too many details because next we have looks for authorization and here we are doing adaptive for authentication in fine grain mode but I want to give you some details here regarding what we're doing regarding authentication authorization because basically we're trying to replicate the XACML standard that gives us a certain flexibility when it comes to making authorization and authentication decisions and by applying send us and open ID protocols we can talk to the external world in a standard way within this picture the PAP above is Amadillo looks as the PAP the policy decision point that is in the middle and within that decision point that is looks will link all the FIPS all those policy information points to make implementation decisions for certain service check whether the caller has authorization here there will be a functional authorization regarding who that person is so they have access to that account with all the complexity entailed in accounts but in decision making we'll have our own security engines fraud engines I'm talking in plural because this will be in production in June so there are fraud engines geolocation engines which will also check the location of the AP and endless things and then all the behavior side that will help us make better security decisions on who comes in because eventually the most important thing here is to be sure that the person who calls the customer who calls that microservice that, that transaction has the right identity and has the permissions to execute that service very quickly now because so far we've only talked about protect prevention this is what we've done for the last year and a half we try to avoid certain things from happening but this is not reality in fact things may actually happen we'll obviously try to do everything in our hands so that this will not happen and these are my work entails but we need to face this and that eventually may have some problems and we're beginning to work just like we changed the whole philosophy of dream prevention so that things will not happen we're working on how we need to change the whole philosophy to try to detect respond 
and eventually talk about predicting what may happen so that we may act before that happens. And these are just a few more ideas. Right now we're debating on how to do things. A year and a half ago we were talking about what to do to solve all the problems I mentioned. But we are starting to see some guidelines. Well, this needs to be global with the best cyber security capabilities we may achieve or acquire in the bank. This needs to be data centered with the number of attacks we have. This doesn't just scale with people who are looking at logs. We need to have as much information as possible and making the best decision possible based on the objective information we have. We think that this needs to be based on intelligence and we need to have as much intelligence as possible to make the best decisions. This means that apart from having all the possible data in the bank, we need to have all the possible data out of the bank to help us complement decision making. We want to have the best technology available and to make the decisions of complementing this with our own technology development. We want to have our own products in detection and response. And this is one of the things that we're one of the things that we're now discussing. We want to this to happen near real time so that whenever we detect something we're able to change the barriers of prevention or protection in a dynamic way. And this is why one this is one of the things where everything is APified. When you do a transaction, BVA is paying now, you go there with your login and password, and then you have your OTP on your mobile or your software token to operate and do money transactions. If we see certain anomalies, why don't we do enforcement and ask for a second ATP from other mechanism that is interacting? Why don't we make prevention decisions in real time based on those anomalies or attacks we may experience? That's the underlying concept here. And once again, the whole thing begins in a place that is very far away from this that I'm describing. We have paper-based policies, so certain committees deciding on things and how to act, and how can we do things with the information we have, which is not complete. We have analysts instead of in artificial intelligence algorithms to detect more things and improve decision making. Once again, we're at the beginning of a whole new context in detection in detecting replies. But then I ask you to reflect about what was more important for all this to happen. And for us, the most important thing is talent, people. If we're going to have our own developments that are open source based, with everything I mentioned, we might buy less things from vendors or suppliers. But as I said, we will not have anyone to call whenever we have problems in production. So the only way to solve this is with talent. With talent that is not common to find in the market. Both in prevention and detection and reply. It is not the usual profile that we look for and find easily. There are people who have been working on these things independently or in certain specific companies, but this is something that large companies, at least in Spain, even though the security architecture role is not as developed as in the USA, for example, or in companies such as Google, but at least in Spain or in the Latin world, companies have not empowered these roles. They have empowered or developed the COVID risk analysis expert or vulnerabilities expert, but we have this dilemma. We know that talent and capabilities are extremely, extremely important 
but this talent is not easy to find. And here we're doing different things. One of the most relevant ones that is having a high impact is what we call the Nini Academy, which are all the technology, well, and basically this entails all the technology teams. This only happens in architecture so far because we're the leaders in these technological changes. So we have a certain budget for the training courses we deem appropriate. This budget doesn't come from the training department, but you have your own itinerary according to the courses taking place and the training you give to your colleagues or externally, and whether you are a reference point in that technological discipline, your belt grows, or you change belts, and then you go to the green belt, and you get a more open concept in training and technological education. And here we have a bit of everything, not just security. So eventually we can move people internally. And how are we, are we articulating all this? Basically, by creating these startups that I was mentioning earlier. Companies that belong 100% to the group and join ventures with a third, with third party providers such as Atio, which is a joint venture with Atio for all our data platform. And we'll link that to large partnerships that we think may be helpful to work together in this path. This is the alliance strategy we have. In fact, it is not shown there because it's very recent. But we have just created a company, a joint venture, that will basically work in developing biometric technologies for us. And we think that biometry is something strategic where we mix security improvement with usability improvement. On February 10th, we'll sign the term sheet and we have agreed to create a company focused only on biometrics technology development for a platform. And this is the end. What we're doing is really passionate and exciting but we have the feeling that the world is finishing because all the mindset that we've had in technology and security in the last few years is changing. So it's the end of the world, but it's cool. And it's cool that we're in this party since the beginning on security. So, well, if you're interested in this and if you like what we're doing and what we're talking about, we're there, we are hiring the best, we have security archi architect offers on LinkedIn and you'll be welcome to apply. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan Francisco. Are there any questions from the floor? No questions? I do apologize, we can barely see anything. Okay, here. Hello. Congratulations for your presentation. A couple of questions. What does internal regulator regard regarding the open source usage? Are they giving you problems about it? Regarding the lack of support that you mentioned? And how do you articulate the management of DevOps teams regarding the segregation of environments in the data protection regulation? Well, going to this question, this change that we're leading from architecture is a change that needs to happen in all layers of the company. And right now, this is not happening, but yesterday, in fact, in general knowledge, they were saying how they were doing agile projects. We've had open source discussions. They're not very feisty, and we're just working and collaborate and see how we solve this. However, we cannot give up that principle because it's strategic for us. Regarding the production access, this is yet another example where we're improving things with this philosophy. We're doing leap platforms so that the administrators do not have credentials on the machines. And in the case of DevOps, 
it is not the developers who upload the code into production. It's totally automated once they have the checks to go into production. They don't need to do a push with their own credentials when it comes to accessing data. Are there any other questions? Up here? Hola. Lo primero, enhorabuena por... Hi, congratulations for your presentation. And secondly, I'd like to insist on the data protection follow-up. How will this affect you? Well, the different data protection acts in force and to be in force in the future are quite complex. Complying with everything that the regulation states regarding the consent is hard. In the historical legacy technologies we had, it would be hell. Here, however, since all data are centered in a lambda architecture, we think that we are in the path of having more compliance success, but it would be very painful because historically large companies have data scattered. They didn't even quite know who was unloading certain data and what for. And eventually, this is about giving more time to market and more flexibility, but things will be more unified and the rules of the game will be clearer. In that regard, I'm quite optimistic and we need to see how we integrate these with all the data that are in the legacy systems. And basically, we need to start running, which, which is something we're already doing to implement data and transactions in this new platform. I haven't told you, but our aim is to intercept the flow. All the new projects will be launched on this platform and we'll have a migration plan for the next five years so that the 80% of things in production will be included here. 80% because 20% of things will not be changed. So to answer your questions, it will be tricky. But we're working on that consent architecture, as we call it, because it's the most difficult point to comply with the new data protection laws. Okay, I see two hands down there. So two last questions, please. We can actually talk in the break if you have any other questions. Congratulations for your presentation. Very quickly, what do you think about how you about what you need to do to be up to standards in the ENISA? Directive in the NIS directive. Well, we need, just need to work a lot. We need to understand how this affects us, and we need to understand the reality of what we need to do without making people afraid. This is what one of the things that the security teams did. We scared people so much so they would listen to us. Since they were not listening, we just scared people. But the other side of the coin is that we have lost credibility. So I think that has to do with compliance and direct directives involves getting reasonable outputs and secondly being very realistic in what we need to do without scaring people, making people afraid or creating big fires in the organization. And the very last question Thank you, Juan Fram. You talked about a 10,000 meter high approach, but for other banks or institutions who want to approach these kind of projects, what are your main ideas? You mean three quick wins regarding what you may find and what people need to be aware about. Okay, I'm gonna give you a bird's view about it. But first of all, whoever leads this mess needs to be talk upward and downward and have full empowerment to execute at all levels. In our case, the architectural leader is Iñaki, Iñaki Bernal. He's a guy who knows about technology, he knows how to be in political meetings, and that's essential for me. Without that, and if the leader of this doesn't have the empowerment of the top management, 
and the money to do this, to make decisions, solve projects, and to know why this is more important, without that it will be impossible. And my second tip would be that bosses should be there. My only aim in this whole thing is that my guys and my teams are working in a modern way, they shouldn't have any potholes. The bosses should be getting any stones and potholes out of the, out of the way and recruiting the best talent for this to happen. Last year we created a team from scratch that I think is a great team. They just couldn't be better to get into this mess. We obviously need to keep growing because we are um, involved in everything. We have often complained that security wasn't there, but here we have a double serving. We're in everything, in absolutely everything. So, you know, we need to have an empowerment boss. And on the other side, we need to, to be aware that the boss needs to let the team work, getting out any blockages out of the way and getting the best talent. Those are the main takeaways. Thank you very much, Juan Francisco. Big round of applause for him, please. So let's go for the coffee break now, and we'll be back at 12.30.